Welcome everyone to today's performance clinic. The topic today is extending the value of Dynatrace for ZOS using the mainframe SDK. I'm Andy Grabner. I'm running these performance clinics. Everything is recorded. So if you see this live, great. If you don't, well, you watch the recording. If you want to watch it again, you, get to, you can get the recording. The slides will also be made available, but most of the content today is live demo, live coding. I already saw some terminal windows in preparation. <laughs> And I just want to really pass it over right away to Christian. Christian Schrams, thank you so much for joining. Maybe a couple of words to you as a person, like who are you, what's your role? Um, and then we'll dive into the topic. Yeah, thanks Andy for the introduction. Uh, great that I'm able to do another performance clinic together with you on the mainframe subject. Yeah, my name is Christian Schramm, uh, sales engineering manager at Dynatrace. I'm supporting all topics around mainframe. I'm some kind of interface between the field, our field reps and SEs and the Lintz lab. Um, and yeah, I'm gathering requirements from the market and feed it back to our lab. So I'm working closely with the Lintz lab. Uh, my background, I'm more than 25 years in the mainframe space actually. I'm now, or uh, the, on May 2nd, it was my 21st anniversary at Dynatrace. So uh, I'm already uh, a long time in the company and dealing with, with all aspects of mainframe. I started out as a developer, performance analyst, systems programmer until I joined uh, Dynatrace. And as I said, I'm dealing with all aspects around the mainframe and located, as Andy said, in Austria near the Linz lab. Wow. Yeah, so. 21 years, I didn't know that, that's been that long. You know what's funny? 21 years ago, I graduated, actually it was 23 years ago, I graduated from high school. Uh, my high school was a hotel in Leonding, specialized on software engineering, and I was, they, they programmed uh, they trained us a little bit on mainframe programming and back then they already told us yeah uh, the mainframe it's probably going to go away soon anyway uh 23 years later after my graduation 21 years after you started your job here the mainframe is still an amazingly hot topic absolutely correct yeah so and actually leonding is near the place where i grew up so uh oh. interesting stuff here as well yeah as you say Mainframe is still a hot topic on the market. So um, there are a lot of interesting things going on uh, in the field and on the market. And yeah, mainframe is still there. It's reliable, it is scalable and uh, lots of old, let's say legacy code is running on the mainframe, but not only that, also new uh, applications are being built on the mainframe and that's why uh, the mainframe is still an important topic as well. Also for Dynatrace, we introduced the mainframe agents in the Dynatrace platform two years ago where we actually did our last performance clinic. So that was the initial version and a lot of things have been introduced in the mainframe support as well. So that's something I will talk about a little bit later. So let's dive into the agenda. What will we uh, discuss today? One thing, of course, a short introduction, Dynatrace for CUS, what it is, how it is deployed, and then dive into the topic of today, uh, what can be achieved with the mainframe SDK to extend the value of Dynatrace for mainframe on top of what is already delivered out of the box. And the main part of today is of course a live demo. So I will uh, put my hands on some COBOL code, change the COBOL code, uh, introduce some API calls, uh, which talk to the Kicks agent and Hopefully you will get an idea what can be achieved with that. Actually, uh, lots of customers are already leveraging the SDK, not only for 
um, tagging unsupported protocols, but also to grab additional data from the mainframe application. Yeah, q and I will do some short breaks and look at Andy if there are any questions in between, but at the end, we will go through the questions anyway. Um, so please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A feature. Yeah, Dynatrace for COS support. What is it actually? Uh, so the focus is, that's very important to know, is the IBM set series mainframe. Um, we are focusing on COS. You know, there are different flavors of mainframes out in the market space, like Fujitsu Siemens, PS2000. Also the I-series is called the mainframe, the, the former AS400. But with our Dynatrace for COS support, we specifically focus on the set series and uh, especially COS. So you see here in the picture, um, the mainframe support seamlessly fits into the Dynatrace platform. So once you deploy one agent on all the application tiers, we will be able to follow transactions end to end from the user click in the browser uh, or on the mobile device over all application tiers back into the mainframe backend. We are supporting uh, different technologies, Kix IMS, of course. We also support C Linux, Red Hat, Red Hat, SUSE Ubuntu. We introduced CPU related infrastructure metrics last year, uh, like the four hour rolling average and the LPA CPU utilization. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we introduced our brand new Java agent for CUS. So you can also monitor your WebSphere application servers and Liberty instances running on the mainframe. And from a database perspective, it's DB2 and DL1. So no matter what you're using as a database, we will be able to see the SQLs and the DL1 statements in the backend as well. Very important, of course, is the middleware support. So it's always crucial how you connect to the mainframe, how your distributed application tiers call into the mainframe. There's a variety of technologies out there, like MQ, you see here, we support uh, that as well, um, no matter if it goes into Kix or IMS. Uh, like Trigger Monitor, uh, MQ Bridge is supported. We also support IBM Integration Bus, which um, will be rebranded or has already been rebranded to App Connect Enterprise. That support is there as well. SOAP into Kix or IMS is supported. Kix Transaction Gateway, a very important technology out there in the field. And yeah, the other ones from an IMS perspective, IMS TM resource adapter, IMS Connect API. And soon, and that's uh, a very hot topic on the market as well, COS Connect. So more and more mainframe sites tend to use COS Connect if they do not use it already. So that support will be introduced starting with June 2021. So it's RESTful calls into the mainframe, either Kix and IMS, which allow you to very easily integrate your mainframe applications into your distributed applications. So that support will, will come as well. And uh, not supported protocols like low level protocols, like uh, Kix IP sockets, where we cannot tag the underlying protocol automatically can be tagged with the SDK as well. So also for that purpose, custom, customers are using the SDK to have an end-to-end -end visibility. Yeah, Andy, any questions in the meantime? Yeah, um, so 
Dane uh, asked a question and I already posted a link to a blog post, but the question was, can Dynatrace get detailed information about the CPU utilization from an LPAR? I know that it can show us the utilization, but I cannot see the tasks which are using the CPU, only the Kix IMS processes that I've configured with the OA. So the, with the uh, uh, one agent, I guess. Um, I responded with a link to a blog post that I just found. As I said, mainframe is also not my field of expertise, but a quick Google search revealed a recent blog post. Um, but maybe you want to add something to it in terms of... E yes, so that is absolutely correct. Uh, we do have the LPA CPU utilization. You see it here in the background in yellow. <laughs> That's the LPA CPU utilization and absolutely correct. Uh, we show um, the CPU percentage uh, of the C of, of that overall LPAR, but we do not show all processes. We show the processes where an agent is deployed because these ones are relevant from a Dynatrace perspective, but you know, there are a lot of other workloads running on an LPAR like batch processes and uh, also standard uh, address spaces like TCP IP or DB2 master address spaces where we do not uh, deploy an agent into these processes. So yes, we show the overall CPU utilization, but we do not show, for instance, how much CPU uh, a batch process contributes to the overall utilization. Awesome. And uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you have questions, do it like the others, uh, use the Q&A feature, and then uh, we will have dedicated time to answer all these questions. Thanks. Christian. Okay. Let's move ahead. Yeah, concerning the architecture of the Dynatrace for COS support, it's very easy to set up. The, you basically need a couple of components. One on the distributed environment is a so-called C remote that runs on a server and receives the information from the mainframe. It uh, talks to an active gate, which forwards the information to the Dynatrace cluster. And on the mainframe, you need a couple of components as well. You need a, a started task per LPA, which is shown here as ZTC and C local. The C local is a, a little agent which receives the data from the IMS and kicks agent and also from the Java agent and immediately sends it over to the distributed world to the C remote, which does further processing and forwards it to the Dynatrace cluster. Yeah. And from a load perspective, of course, it's important to size the C remotes appropriately so that the load that can be expected from the mainframe can be handled by these processes. Yeah. So in, in production, you typically use a eight core box to receive traffic from heavily loaded production environments. Also in each Kix IMS and JVM, you deploy an agent and that's basically it. Yeah. So then you are all set. The data will be collected by the Kix IMS and Java module, sends it over to the C local and then it finds its way to the C remote and to the Dynatrace cluster where all the magic happens, where um, the correlation is being done with, with the distributed application paths. Hey, Christian, I have a very strange and maybe a very stupid question. Remember, I don't have the background in mainframe, but I knew a little bit, I know a little bit about uh, Kubernetes. And if I look at this, it's somehow strangely reminds me of a Kubernetes cluster with different cluster nodes where I install one agents. Is this somehow, I don't know, this is maybe a completely stretch idea now, but are we kind of circling back after so many years to very similar architectures? Yeah, and, de yeah. definitely. Yeah, it's absolutely the same 
architecture and idea behind that. You have Kix clusters, you have IMS clusters, you have WebSphere application clusters um, to, to balance the load, to have failover functionality. You can spread the, the Kix regions, the Kix plexes, as they are called, on different LPAs. And no matter where you deploy these plexes, we are able to follow the transactions. Mm -hmm. Hey, and one question just came in. Uh, set remote and active gate, are they on the same server? Yes or no? Um, yes and no. The, the reason why I say that is that the C remote currently is being deployed as part of the active gate installer, but the local active gate uh, that is then sitting on the C remote box will not be used for connecting to the Dynatrace cluster. The C remote then connects to one of the other normal one agent active gates mm -hmm. or to the cluster active gate on the Dynatrace cluster. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yes and no is the answer here. Mm -hmm. I hope I explained it. Uh, but we'll to see your full yeah. satisfaction. Yeah, we'll see if there's a follow-up question coming in from yes, the same person. Right? Yeah, he said thanks. He or she said thanks. Yeah. Yes, but actually there are plans to uh, split the C remote installation from the active gate installer. So mm. the active gate installer is just a wrapper to install the C remote on a okay. server. And that's basically it. Mm -hmm. But we have a project running to, to split that away so that you can deploy the C remote even on an ex existing active gate server, which would um, make it easier, of course, from a deployment perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not need another server for the C remote then. Mm -hmm. Good, let's move ahead to the main topic of today, to the mainframe SDK. Um, the SDK, is available for Kix and IMS. So it can be used uh, from different programming languages. You can use it from PL1, COBOL, or even uh, C code. It is documented uh, on our public documentation. So here is the link. Uh, let's probably go there. So you see here the documentation of the Kicks and IMS SDK. It allows you to uh, tag protocols that are not supported out of the box. That is done via specific API calls like the start pure path, the start linked pure path, but that will not be the topic of today. It's also very easy to use. You simply call the API and can start a transaction or can uh, start a path for a transaction that has been started on a different platform and our correlation engine will then find the different pieces together. But our focus today will be on these API calls, the enter node, the exit node, it will insert additional nodes into the pure path. Um, and that will allow you as well to attach data to these nodes, which you can capture with that data capture API call that allows you to either capture some integer values, some long integer values, of course, as well, or some, some text information. So that gives you the possibility to, to grab some information which could be relevant from a business perspective, like a credit card payment amount, which I will use today or a credit card type. So we do not capture any application specific data with the mainframe agent initially and with the SDK, you have the possibility to do that if it's uh, important for you to have such information 
at your fingertips in the Dynatrace platform. So that is the documentation. The only thing you need to do is if you want to use the SDK is, let's go to the top once again, you need to link that little stop. It's uh, a Dynatrace program which provides an interface to the different API calls. So you need to include that in your linker step and I will show that a little bit later as well. So let's switch back to the slides. So as I've said already, uh, with the SDK, you can tag inbound and outbound requests, which we will not do today. You can capture additional data. That's what I have already mentioned. And that is also being used more and more by customers, you can create exceptions out of your COBOL code. That does not mean that your KICS or IMS transaction is failing, but it is marked with an exception in the Dynatrace platform. And then you can, of course, mark these transactions also as failed, as you know it from the distributed technology stacks. And that gives you the ability um, to create custom exceptions, which are also leveraged by our AI engine then out of the box. So I will show that as well in the demo, how that then looks like. So what will we do today? Uh, we will add some simple SDK code to our COBOL application um, and will create a Dynatrace request attribute so that we can leverage the data that we have captured with the SDK in the Dynatrace platform. It is a credit card payment amount. Um, if you know, and most of you probably know our Easy Travel application where customers can book journeys and at the end of the mainframe, application, a credit card payment is being done. And of course, in the application, we have the credit card type available and also the credit card payment amount. And we will make that available um, in using the Kix SDK. And not only that, we will also mark a pure path with an exception if the credit card type is invalid and the credit card amount is zero. So that gives you then the ability to further leverage our AI engine. Okay, let's go to the live demo. So Christian, maybe before yeah. the live demo, just to have, so that you have it in your head because maybe you'll cover this in your live demo. Uh, one question came in on, the request attributes that you're showing, are they only yeah. possible through the SDK or is it also possible with just the Kix or IMS agent? That's kind of one question. I'm not sure if you want to answer this quickly or if request attributes. Yeah, I, I can answer that quickly. Uh, to leverage the SDKs, of course, you need to have an agent deployed. Huh? So if you want to leverage the Kix and IMS SDK, it's an API call to the actual agent that is sitting in the regions. Mm -hmm. So you cannot use the SDK without an agent. Mm -hmm. um, because okay. if, you, if you do that, you will get a return code from the API call, which is a minus one typically. And that shows you that there is no active agent there. Mm -hmm. I think the question was also around request attributes. <clears throat> Can request attributes in the context of mainframe only be used through the SDK? Or can you also define request attributes without the ah, SDK okay. instrumentation? I understand. No, yeah. you definitely need the SDK. As I okay. said, initially, we do not capture any, any data out of the box with the agents to keep it lightweight and really uh, with low overhead. And if you want to have additional data and also define request attributes, you need to leverage the SDK. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And I also see that our colleague, Mike Horvitz has joined the Q&A 
and he's also giving some answers here on other questions that are coming in. So I think you have awesome support. Greetings, Perfect. Detroit. Hey, Mike. Oh, hopefully all is well. <laughs> Hi. Good. Yeah, so let me switch over to the demo environment. What is Dynatrace? I will not explain here in detail. So hopefully everybody can see that now. I'm here in our demo environment where we monitor actually different applications. Um, and one of the applications is also an easy travel instance, which has a mainframe backend. Uh, you see here a dashboard, which I have created uh, quickly, which shows me the key metrics because I'm the administrator of that mainframe backend. And also always I want to see my key metrics of my mainframe application if my LPA CPU utilization is good, um, which means it's not reaching like 100%. Uh, also, if my kick service is there, if, the, if there is throughput, if no credit card transactions would come in, of course, no journeys would be booked. And that would not be good from an application perspective, of course. I always see the key metrics for my mainframe applications, the, the browser application, and also the mobile app. And of course, I, I can drill down into these applications by going here. And yeah, I, I see from a user perspective how my applications are behaving and can look at the key indicators, but what I want to show here is the service flow, which gives you visibility for that um, browser-based application with the mainframe backend, how the service flow is actually into the mainframe. So by clicking on that service flow, we will get that information. Hopefully I've selected the last 30 minutes and not a full day. Let me quickly check that now. Let's switch to 30 minutes to increase the speed a little bit. So that should be now a little bit faster if we only look at the last 30 minutes. So here you see the service flow for my easy travel mainframe application. It goes through a easy travel web server through a customer front end. And there are a couple of services attached here, the journey service, but the booking service when the customer decides for a certain journey has a mainframe backend, it connects to the mainframe via MQ. You see it here, that's the MQ manager CSQ8 and goes directly into the kicks tier. And in the backend, we have some SQL statements that are being executed. So you see the full flow. You also see the contribution of times and also the number of requests, which is also very important to understand. So you see here per kicks transaction, we have 12 SQL statements being executed here in the DBBBG database. Um, subsystem. So we can then filter for that specific service flow and have a look at the effective transactions. So now we only see that path that goes into the mainframe and can have a look at the transactions that are going into the mainframe. Let's just uh, check a few of these. Let's take the first one here, which shows you then the end-to-end -end flow from the web server over the distributed tiers. There are some distributed SQLs. And finally, we enter the mainframe um, and we are executing a couple of SQLs, a couple of programs. We can have a closer look at that on code level. You see 
different programs are being called. Some SQLs are called. You see the timely contributions. You see some additional metadata concerning the kicks task, like the task ID and other metadata. And you see already here, we already have a request attribute here, the credit card type. So you see for each mainframe transaction, um, which credit card has been used for booking the journey or paying the journey. We will add here because it will be interesting for us from a business perspective as well, what was the actual payment amount? And we want to have that available as well in, in the Dynatrace platform. That's what we will do. We will introduce a new request attribute, which will then be available here in on transaction level as well. And if you know request attributes, they can also be used for creating metrics. You can put these metrics then on dashboards. I will show that also in the live demo. And you can also use the request attributes for uh, looking or searching for specific information. So if you're interested in all the Citibank um, credit card bookings, you can use that re a request attribute here as well. So let's, for instance, show that quickly. If we go back to our dashboard, I have the kick service here. And here on that layer, I have a so-called MDA where I can see the credit card types. So I see how often Visa or MasterCard has been used when there was an invalid credit card type being used that is not supported. And you see the numbers for all the others as well. And from here, you can drill down into the different transactions um, for the Citibank credit card, for instance. But not only can you come from uh, an application perspective, if you are a mainframer, you probably start your analysis directly in your mainframe tier, like the ELPA utilization or how the database is behaving. Uh, you can have a look at your database statements. So you can check these ones out as well. You will see then all the SQLs that have been executed, how often, and what was the actual response time for that. And also very powerful, of course, is if you're interested, who is using that DB2 database, which applications are using that, you can do a backtrace. And here the real power of Dynatrace comes into place. You see the reverse call stack and see exactly which distributed applications are using that credit card transaction or actually these, this DB2 instance. You see um, 99 calls are coming from the mobile app and 412 calls from the browser app. And from here again, you have all uh, possibilities. You can go into the service flow and into the transaction level again. Also, if there are any failures in the mainframe transaction, you are able to see these ones as well, because on the kicks and IMS layer, we give you not only the response times, the CPU times and the throughput uh, over the timeline, but also the failure rates. You see, there are some failures from time to time. And here, actually right now, we have a problem here where there's a failure rate increase and the problem has been detected by our AI engine. And that is completely available to you as well. So if we look at that problem here, we see that it's a failure rate increase in in kicks, 
in our credit card transaction. And the cool thing, of course, now is that you do not only see the failures into in Kicks and DB2, you see also the impact on your distributed applications. You see exactly how many users are impacted by that failure rate increase, because it makes a big difference if only one or two users are impacted in a certain geolocation or if it's a global problem and thousands of users are affected. So you see here 25, uh, 45 users are impacted and 17 in the mobile app. And of course, it wouldn't be Dynatrace if you couldn't identify the users directly to see who was affected by that specific problem. Okay, and of course you can drill down into that specific problem and have a closer look. You see in that transaction, we had 53 failures and it is actually happening in the credit card check program. And it's very easy to identify these failed transactions. They are marked with a red bar. And if we drill down further, we see we had one failure and one exception because the credit card type was invalid. So that is being marked here. And yeah, that was a quick demo. And now we will do um, the hands-on on the COBOL code. We'll introduce a new request attribute. So I will go into my mainframe environment unless there are any questions, Andy. Uh, yeah, there's one question. Well, as first of all, I wanted to double check if the answers that Mike uh, Horwitz has presented are actually visible by the folks that have uh, asked around sizing guide. I think everyone sees these answers, uh, just wanted to double check. But then another one came in just to what you said, and I'm reading it out loud. Can you explain what will be the effect if we set this transaction ID you're showing on the Kix requests on the deep monitoring config? Will it stop the integration with the distributed environment side? Um, I guess the question is referring to the transaction start sensor. Um, yes, you should only leverage that for 3270 uh, 30 transactions, mm -hmm. which do not have a distributed front end. You need to define these transactions then. But we also have an ongoing project now to, to split that transaction start sensor, because right now it is being used for 3270 um, transactions and also for transactions which use a protocol that are not supported out of the box. So we will split these types of transactions and there should be no interference then anymore with the other sensors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. And just a quick time check. Uh, we are 40 minutes in, so uh, just so you know how we are. Yes, so let's go to the mainframe. So I'm here on my development LPAR where I have my easy travel code, my easy travel application, and I will go into the editor and edit my mainframe source code. It's available here in that library. There are a couple of programs which are leveraged here and the credit card type and the credit card payment amount is available in that specific program. And therefore I will open that and put some additional code here. So if I scroll down here to there's some application code here and here we are already capturing here with the SDK, the credit card type. So that's the SDK code, which is already in there. And if we scroll further down, I've commented out 
oops, the code that I will be introducing now. So I will adding new code and let me explain what we are doing here. We are here capturing additional data with that DTDCI as I've shown in the doc, we are capturing uh, an integer value and I'm here now capturing the payment, which is the credit card payment amount. Uh, the part after the if is just for providing an error message if we get a, ne uh, a negative return code, uh, we're logging a message here. But for capturing the data, this integer value, we simply call that API with call DTDCI, I for integer. And also what we need to do is we need to um, add another node into the pure path. The node will be called credit card payment. We will see then that one then in the pure path. And with that call DT and F, we are adding that node. So we can give it any name. It should be eight characters. And that's basically it. Node name and calling that API call here. We enter or add an additional node in that specific transaction. And what we are uncommenting here now is doing the following. We are checking here if the payment is equal zero or not. If it's zero, we are creating an exception for that specific pure path. So that pure path will be marked with an exception in Dynatrace. If the payment is not zero, we will simply close that node. Anytime we enter a node, we need to close it as well. That's what we need to do here. And that's what is happening here. The DTXX is closing the node and additionally adds an exception. And that's pretty much it. I need to oops, add some more lines here. Yeah, I've added everything. So capturing a value, uh, entering a node, adding a node to the pure path and then closing the node uh, with an exception or not. And that's basically it. I will save that source code and we'll do the compile. That is my compile JZL. It will compile and link that specific Kix program. And you see here in the linker step, I've included that DT stop, that Dynatrace stop for the SDK. And that's it. If I submit that JZL, I hopefully get uh, max CC zero, which means everything is okay. No uh, syntax errors in the source code are there and that's it. Now I need to activate that program in Kix. So therefore I will switch over to my Kix backend, which is this one. Welcome to Kix. And what I need to do is after I have compiled and linked my program, I need to activate it in Kix that is done via a specific command. That's my program name now, TDMD. If I do that without new copy, I see the length of the program that is currently active in that Kix region. And by providing new copy, I activate the new version of that Kix program. And you will see the length will change as I have added new code here. And voila, our new program version is active. Let's look at the time. It's 5.45 Central European summertime. And 
let's go back to our Dynatrace environment. That's basically what we wanted to do. Let's go to the dashboard here, look at our kicks requests that are coming in. So new requests should now come in with an additional request attribute. Let's check that one. If it already holds it, no, that is already or still an old one. So let's wait a little bit more and refresh that screen. You see there's a new one now and that should hold now additional data. No, not yet. It's still an old one. Let's wait a little bit further. Can take a couple of seconds until it reaches the Dynatrace environment. Yes. While, while you are waiting on this, just a quick question that always yes, comes please. up. Um, uh, overhead is always a question that people are interested in. Can you say something quickly about overhead of all of this? Yes, that's a very important uh, topic always for uh, mainframe agents. Um, the overhead is typically less than 2%. We have done several assessments in the last couple of months and uh, two, less than 2% is our official uh, number that we provide, but uh, our experience with the last assessments is that it is even less than 1%. Yeah? Very good. So you can really use it in production environments 24 by seven. Mm -hmm. The overhead is really very low uh, compared to the value it provides. Mm -hmm. hey, and then there's one question that just came in, uh, another one on the request attributes. So the request attributes were created using the SDK coding only. No need to additionally create the request attributes in the settings UI in Dynatrace. Yes, we need to create the request attribute now. That's very important to do. So we have now new transactions coming in here. So let's check these transactions here. You see, if we go to transaction level, we have now that new node CC payment, that is actually the node that we have provided in the code. And it already holds some data. You see the 2183, it has no name yet. Uh, that is actually the payment amount for that journey that was paid with that credit card. And what we need to do now that it has a meaning in Dynatrace to create a request attribute. Mm -hmm. That's what we will do in the settings now. If we go to server-side service monitoring, we will define a new request attribute. Let's call it credit card payment. Yeah. It is a double value and we only have one value so we can take the first value. And now we need to add a new data source. Our data source is the Kix SDK. So we can keep all these settings. We just need to select here the Kix SDK. And the node name begins with CC payment. Uh, so that's the name of our node. We can use begins with, we can also say equals, then we have to provide the exact name, but let's uh, do it like that. And once that is defined, this request attribute will show up in our Kix transactions. I hope you save this now. Did you save the request attributes? Uh, we will, I, ah, yeah. <laughs> let's check it quickly. I have made this mistake too many times. <laughs> 
So, but that's that's great. So on the one side with the SDK, you are emitting data that is captured as part of the pure path. Yeah. And uh, then right. and then the the request attribute definition is then making sure to tell Dynatrace what to do with this data, like extracting it as a request attribute, putting it on the pure path as a request attribute so you can do all the great things with it, like the multidimensional analysis, you can create calculated service metrics and everything. Absolutely correct. So let's look at the transactions now, the newer ones. And check if it's there. Yes, voila. You see here, if we go to the pure path level, we have now the credit card payment available here as well with 1500. And now we can leverage that request attribute uh, on top of what we have already. So what we could do, for instance, here in our kick service, we could create a new analysis view. So let's select our request attribute here, the credit card payment. And then we see the average credit card payment here. If I save that view, I will have it available at my fingertips on the kick service. So that is available here now as well. So we can check any times the credit card payments now from now on. And also we can create the metric now leveraging that request attribute. So we can actually do it from here as well. Uh, change monitoring settings. Okay, probably. Yeah, probably I'm locked on with, not with the right user. Let's try it from here. Or maybe I've used the wrong permissions. Let's check it quickly. So you can create a new metric here. Interesting. A new metric here. Um, let's call it credit card payment and use that request attribute here. We can even provide a custom unit, which would be Euro for instance, and select our management zone here, which is mainframe. And if we add a condition here, no, actually we don't need that. And if we save that metric, it will be available as well for being put on a custom chart. Oh, okay. Hmm. I don't have the- Permissions on the demo environment. The, uh, probably I logged in not with the admin uh, authorization. So if you save that, you have a metric and then you can also leverage it on your dashboard and add it here. For instance, here, if we resize that, you can add a new custom chart and leverage that new metric if you are able to save it and have the right permissions, you can do that. And then you can select here the new metric, which I was not able to save here in that specific case. And then you have it available on your dashboard as well. It works with the right user, you see it here. Then you have the credit card payment 
on your dashboard as well and can always see how much payments are coming in from your credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was it basically with the demo. Are there any additional questions? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. I think questions already came in. Uh, thanks for some really active users that asked a lot of great questions also to answer. Yes, the session was recorded, so you can rewatch it because there was a lot of great info in there. Uh, typically, I would probably say tomorrow, the recording will be up on both university.dynatrace.com if you go to the Dynatrace webinar section. Also, you will be able to watch the same webinar on the YouTube channel that I have for the performance clinics. And uh, I will send in the short link to that YouTube channel as well on the, the chat. If anybody else has questions, please put them into the Q&A feature. We still have two or three minutes to go. I think Christian, though, all, most of the other questions I have you know, thrown over at you already as they came in. Um, some suggestions came in in terms of the UX team should um, kind of try to align the way where we place all of our safe buttons and, 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 and uh, confirm <laughs> buttons that will make it easier, but people are working on it. Um, there's some great uh, feedback on, on you as a presenter, Christian. So thank you so much. It was an amazing session. Thanks. If anybody's interested in the stuff that you showed in the end around the calculated service metrics, I also do have a couple of performance clinics uh, that you can already watch on these kind of features. So let me actually one agent tutorials. Let me just validate that I didn't make a typo mistake here, but I should be, here we go. So I'm just sending you the link, everyone uh, in the chat. This is where you will find the, uh, the recording, hopefully by tomorrow. And you find also all the other recordings and university.dynatrace.com. This is the other link I want to send you. This is where you also find all of these recordings. Um, and for those performance clinics where we had uh, a lot of slide material, we also upload the slides. Um, yeah, uh, just a quick question. I know, Christian, we're running almost out of time and there might be some folks that can answer this question better, but obviously it had to come up. How is Dynatrace licensed on the mainframe? Quickly overview. Dynatrace is licensed on an MSU basis. So depending on the MSU capacity of your environment, the license will be provided. Of, of course, it also only refers to the environments that you are actively uh, monitoring. The LPAS, where you do not put agents, will not be part of that MSU capacity. Very good. Um, Christian, if some people have other questions following up, I know you are obviously you're active on answers.dynatrace.com. That's our community forum. I'm sure people can reach out to you. I mean, the, the, the mainframe community is big, but still, I guess, especially those that are interested in monitoring and uh, observability, hopefully can reach out to you via, I guess, hooking you up on LinkedIn or something like that. Yes, definitely. Just just ping me, christian.charm at dynatrace.com or LinkedIn or Twitter, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm available Perfect. on all channels. Perfect. And now, uh, again, thank you so much, Christian. I hope it doesn't take another two years until I'll have you back. Um, Hopefully not, yes. Yeah. Uh, but having a mainframe guy on Twitter, LOL, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got you to gotta teach these young kids on Twitter how to behave socially. <laughs> So that's why you need some folks like like Christian on Twitter as well. And uh, seriously, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll have you back. See you soon. And stay Great. safe. Thanks, and Andy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.